¿Aló? Está funcionando. Ok. Right. So, um, first of all, good morning, everyone um, who are here in the audience. Good morning and good afternoon to those following us online remotely. Um, my name is Carlos Gallo. I am a senior legal manager at Media Defense, and we're hosting this panel uh, with UNESCO on litigation and accountability for Pegasus surveillance against journalists. We're thrilled today to have a really uh, fantastic panel with two uh, very brave journalists and three very intrepid human rights lawyers who are challenging uh, surveillance uh, in courts and uh, with their work, their outstanding work uh, around the world. Uh, we aim in this panel to discuss uh, accountability and uh, litigation efforts to counter Pegasus surveillance. Obviously, there are many other ways to counter, to fight back against this type of surveillance. In other panels today, we'll hear from, from uh, very interesting experts um, on other initiatives to counter Pegasus, but in this panel, we'll be focusing on accountability and litigation. Um, first of all, I'd like to just mention that I'll introduce the panelists as they speak uh, to uh, not waste much time in my introduction. But we're hearing from Khadija Ismailova, Sienna Anstis, Caroline wilson Palo, and Priscilla Ruiz, and Carlos Dada also joining us remotely. Um, just to put things in context a little bit, um, you might have seen in the past week that it's been reported that UK officials, um, Indian journalists, Palestine citizens, and Spanish politicians were victims of, alleged victims of Pegasus surveillance uh, in their countries. Um, the High Commissioner for Human Rights mentioned just uh, a few days ago that 45 countries are reportedly using Pegasus against their citizens um, in total secrecy and outside any legal framework. In our opinion, um, courts and legal systems need to do more to counter uh, this type of illegal surveillance. And it's our hope that this panel will shed light into some of the very interesting initiatives and brave uh, work being done by human rights defenders, lawyers, and journalists around the world to shed light to the problem and to counter it in court and with other accountability mechanisms. So without much further ado, um, I'd like to first uh, bring in uh, Khadija Ismailova to, to our panel. But before, before Khadija intervenes, I just wanted to give you a few um, uh, instructions on how it's going to work. I should have done that in the beginning. The panel is being broadcast in Spanish and English. If you're joining us remotely, you have an option between English and Spanish. And those in the audience um, also have a translation equipment. If you haven't got uh, translation equipment, please raise your, rent, uh, raise, your, uh, raise your hand and someone from the organization will help you uh, with, the, with the translation equipment. We hope to have 15 to 20 minutes for questions and answers at the end, so do those joining remotely can write uh, your questions online and I'll read them here, and those in the audience can raise your hand and we'll have someone who will bring you a microphone uh, for you to, to ask your questions to, to our panelists. So, first of all, uh, Khadija Ismailova. Uh, you're, Khadija is a journalist and investigator from Azerbaijan. She won the 2016 uh, UNESCO World Press Freedom Award, and uh, she's an award-winning journalist, an extremely brave journalist, uh, because of the, the, the reporting she's done over the years. She's been detained, she's been prosecuted, she won four cases, at the European Court of Human Rights, and she's got another five cases pending against uh, Azerbaijan. So someone who's uh, had to go to court to fight, to continue reporting and uh, protecting her right to freedom of expression. Khadija, you were recently, uh, on top of all the harassment and surveillance you've been through over the years, last year it was reported that you were on the list of Pegasus victims in Azerbaijan. Um, could you tell us a bit how did you react to that news and what are journalists in Azerbaijan doing to counter this threat uh, coming uh, against you? Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you for 
coming, despite all the confusion with the time announcement and so on. Well, <clears throat> first of all, I need to uh, uh, reiterate, people do not get into those lists for nothing. Uh, you end up being watched, surveilled, because uh, the government fears of something uh, you are doing. So in my case, it was the investigation into corruption on the highest level in Azerbaijan. Uh, that's what I've been doing uh, in the past, I don't know, 15, 20 years, I don't remember. Anyway, uh, that's what I've been doing. There were lawyers, other journalists, and there were other people who would not even suspect that they would be in that list. They would be surveilled by the government. For, for example, there was a taxi driver there. The taxi driver would never suspect that he is so interesting for the government. Well, the problem of that taxi driver was that he was driving me uh, very frequently. He was in the neighborhood and I've been using his services. So he ended up on that list because I've been calling him to see if he's around and I can use his services. There were a couple other friends who had nothing to do with either politics or journalism or human rights issues. Uh, they've just happened to be my friends, uh, people from my surrounding, a boyfriend, and they ended up in that list. There were family members who had nothing to do with anything dangerous for the government, but they were close to me. And uh, the list from Az uh, with Azerbaijani numbers, I, I've seen the leaked list the full leaked list. It was so extensive, it, there were too many numbers, and uh, I found out that 99 numbers from my phone book coincide with the uh, list of surveilled people. So it's not only me who have been threatened, it's also the people who were in touch with me. And that's the most dangerous part of me. Because for me, the, this story is not new. I've been through it. I had, in 2012, I had uh, been blackmailed with the footage filmed by secret cameras from my bedroom. So, uh, and I managed to prove that the government was behind it and the government was behind uh, tampering the investigation into this crime. I won the case in the European Court of Human Rights against the government. So there was, there is, still there is no justice in the, into that. No one had been punished for uh, putting a camera in my bedroom. So, but for me, it was a lesson. I knew that my life can be a target. Uh, my life can be watched. Everything might be watched. I'm used to live with the feeling that there can be camera in my bedroom, in my bathroom, in my living room. So that's what already happened to me. But not the people who, how, who I am in touch with. So it seems like I'm not being target only myself, but I also make them targets. And kudos to the bravery of those people who did not end their relationship, their acquaintance with me, even after the Pegasus uh, revelations. But uh, still, I feel responsible towards all those people. And uh, I feel responsible to all the whistleblowers who had contacted me for... Um, I felt responsible to my sister who was in hospital and I've been taking her pictures and sending uh, to her doctors and uh, so the parts of the body, and I had to send those pictures to her doctor to so he would see the healing is going well or not. I've felt uh, responsible toward all the journalists who I've, I have been in touch with and who, who came to my trainings or helped me with investigations. I feel responsible towards all the sources who ha I had responsibility to keep secret, but I failed to do so because of the Pegasus surveillance system. So when I've learned about this, uh, I felt guilty. I did nothing to do that. I did nothing wrong. I've been doing my job. I've been living my life. But I felt guilty towards all those people. So that was the first feeling I had when I heard about it. 
And uh, when I, um, when we informed people, other people who were on the list, uh, there were different reactions. Some people felt anger, some people th felt helpless, some people felt that, <laughs> some people felt that they are important. Like, it was so kind of different kind of reactions. Some people felt that, why is that they are not in the list? Aren't they doing enough uh, work to be uh, watched, to be taken serious by the government? So there were all kinds of reactions, all kinds of reactions. A lot of people decided to file a lawsuit. And that's where another ordeal starts. Maybe we will touch that later. Oh, thank you very much, Khadija. That's uh, chilling to, to hear from you um, what you've been through over the years and, uh, and also the, the latest, uh, uh, you know, very concrete effects of this, of knowing that you're on the list and you've been surveilled. And I just wanted to pick up on what you said because, um, you know, Surveillance doesn't only affect privacy, it, touch, it violates your, your privacy for sure, but it violates your, your social relationships, your right to thought, of freedom of expression, um, your preferences, your relationships. Um, it puts people at risk. You know, there's no source protection, as you said. Uh, your sources are, are gone and uh, they've been revealed or they're now known by those who attacked you. Uh, but also other people who are now at risk for the casual encounter they had with you so and i have to add one thing one of the first questions i've asked when uh, the group of journalists who've been investigating the matter told me that i'm on the list one of the first questions i asked how much it costs to to do that surveillance and i've been told that only my surveillance uh costed around a quarter million dollars to the government and i and apart from all the sufferings it brings to our lives, apart from all the, it's such a waste of money. It's, it, it's another problem that it's a mismanagement of the public resources. Absolutely, absolutely, without a doubt. And, and this is happening in authoritarian regimes as, uh, as Azerbaijan where you live, but also in democracies who are also deploying this type of software against their citizens. And now I'd like to bring in uh, Sienna Anstis from, from uh, uh, Citizen Lab. She's a senior legal advisor at Citizen Lab, and I think we all, we all know who, uh, who Citizen Lab is. And at the University of Toronto, they've been fundamental uh, to discovering, to establishing that all these uh, mobile phones have been tracked and hacked and surveilled by Pegasus, and, um, and that they're being used by governments around the world. And uh, in addition to the technical aspect, which is crucial, but it's not the focus of our panel, uh, Siena, uh, would you be able to give us an overview of the ongoing litigation efforts around the world, both by individuals and companies, and how, how is that playing out, please? Yeah, uh, great to be here. And thank you for those wonderful opening remarks. So over the past few years, we have seen significant developments in litigation against NSO Group in relation to the abuse of its Pegasus spyware. So as you mentioned here, I'll, I'll provide a sort of high level lay of the land um, to situate everybody. So as you're probably aware, NSO Group is an Israeli-based company that manufactures and sells a powerful spyware market as, as Pegasus. And when successfully installed on your device, it provides full access to its contents, as we've just heard. So over the past few years, research by the Citizen Lab, Amnesty International, Forbidden Stories, among other organizations, has shown that spyware is abused by governments in violation of international human rights law and used to surveil journalists, human rights defenders, and other members of civil society, and not just in authoritarian regimes. The Citizen Lab alone has documented hundreds of cases of such abuse. At the same time, as instances of abuse continue to break, we are seeing a growth in litigation to attempt to address this issue of spyware. And here I'll, I'll try to sort of um, pull that into a bigger picture. So to start with, there are a number of kind of different plaintiffs and defendants in litigation regarding or related to NSO Group. So one set of plaintiffs are companies whose services and platforms are used by NSO Group to deliver spyware. So in particular in the United States, we've seen both Apple and Meta WhatsApp um, suing NSO Group in federal court in California, which was an interesting development. 
Um, another set of plaintiffs, a particular relevant for here, this panel, are individuals who've been targeted with NSO groups by where, such as journalists and human rights defenders and other members of civil society. So we are seeing a proliferation of these types of cases or the intention to start such cases around the world and in various jurisdictions, as varied as Israel, the UK, France, India, and Spain. Litigation by victims may be against the company itself or against the operator, so the country who is thought to be using NSO Group's products to conduct targeted surveillance activities. We are also seeing both a mix of civil and criminal actions, so complaints may be civil complaints, such as the litigation we've seen developing against Bahrain and Saudi Arabia by Pegasus victims in the UK, um, which is being led by a law firm called Lee Day. We also have Bindman's LLP also in the UK, which has um, recently put NSO Group, the UAE and Saudi Arabia on formal notice of an intended hacking claim by three UK-based civil society leaders and human rights activists. Another interesting example are the proceedings in the Indian Supreme Court, which were brought by petitioners targeted with NSO Group spyware in India. This led to the development of a technical committee to investigate the situation in India, whose work is ongoing. And I think it'll be very interesting to see what their conclusions are. We are also seeing attempts to initiate criminal complaints, such as the recent complaint filed by the French Palestinian activist, Allah Hamouri, with the Paris prosecutor after he was targeted with NSO Group spyware. And the Paris prosecutor's office announced that it opened an investigation into Pegasus in 2021 after receiving complaints from Mediapart and two of its reporters, as well as other journals. Further, we are also seeing attempts to use the judicial system to prevent NSO Group from being able to export its technology. So in 2018, Israeli petitioners with the support of Amnesty sought to have the Israeli Ministry of Defense revoke the security export license of NSO Group. This attempt unfortunately failed. However, I think litigation focused on export license permissions could potentially be an interesting avenue to pursue in the long run against companies that are located in Europe, particularly in light of the new dual use regulation rules. So finally, in addition to litigation, this I think is also a very interesting development. We are seeing a growth in state investigations into the abuse of NSO Group's spyware. Although admittedly, there have been very mixed results to date. So most recently, the European Committee has constituted a committee to investigate the issue of Pegasus and their work is now ongoing. Um, we've also seen some assessments by national privacy bodies regarding the legality of this type of spyware, also with mixed results. For example, the Hungarian National Authority for Data Protection and Freedom of Information purported to have investigated the use of Pegasus in Hungary and seemed to just dismiss the situation, finding no violations. However, the European Data Protection Supervisor issued a report stating <clears throat> that the use of Pegasus spyware was incompatible with European democratic values, which I think sets a strong foundation for further arguments that it's used by states, at least in Europe, is, is illegal. So broad investigations into the abuse of Pegasus spyware are likely to be critical in the process of bringing accountability because they could take potentially a more systemic approach to the use of Pegasus or other spyware and potential violations of human rights versus victims having to come forward one by one and pursuing legal action against their governments, which I think was alluded to before is an expensive, time consuming and emotionally exhausting process as well. That said, I think it's unlikely we'll see such kind of investigations in the context of, for example, Saudi use of Pegasus against human rights defenders, but we may have more traction for this in European countries. Um, so this, hopefully this short summary provides a helpful response, um, picture of the scale of diversity of ongoing litigation. And I'm happy to answer any questions regarding potential challenges with such litigation. So I'll hand it now back to Carlos. Wow, Sina, thank you so much. Uh, what, a, what a short presentation, but uh, so complete that gives us uh, uh, the state of the art on, on all the efforts uh, around the world, uh, specifically uh, Middle East, Europe, and the, the Americas, and well, you mentioned India as well, uh, and investigations at all sorts of levels, individual cases, uh, private companies going after um, the tech companies, individuals, parliaments, uh, and other bodies investigating uh, the use of surveillance software at, at a broader level. And uh, as, as you mentioned, it's not just Pegasus. Uh, there, there are other software that uh, is being deployed uh, by, by other governments. I think over the weekend there was a re report of, of an American company who's apparently able to track billions of phones uh, in real time all over the world. So uh, there, are, there are new uh, software, new equipment being discovered every day by, by very brave journalists. And I think your, your overview of litigation gives us uh, perhaps a little bit of hope um, that uh, there is a possibility of um, taking those responsible to, to account for what they've done. 
And in terms of accountability, I'm going to switch now to, to Carlos Dada, who uh, is the founder and director of El Faro. It's an, an, an online outlet, media outlet in El Salvador, one of the most courageous uh, uh, media outlets uh, in the Americas, for sure, who have been going through a tremendous uh, amount of harassment and pressure uh, from, from all, 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 cor all corners uh, of the government uh, and continue to report uh, brilliantly uh, on human rights violations, corruption, um, and the use of Pegasus, uh, coincidentally. Um, Carlos, you've been uh, a victim of, of Pegasus as well. Recently, uh, it was reported that uh, the whole uh, staff of El Faro was under surveillance. Um, I understand, um, how, how do you see um, um, this use of, of surveillance against journalists uh, uh, at your outlet? And also, I understand you're pursuing a different kind of accountability already, and you've had a, a, a hearing recently um, at the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights. Could you, could you tell us a bit about this, please? Well, um, first of all, Carlos, uh, thank you for your generous words. Um, uh, and thank you to your organization, uh, Media Defense, for all your support uh, in helping us to legally um, defend ourselves from all the fronts opened by um, the actual uh, Salvadoran government against us. Um, and if you allow me, I want to also thank um, Citizen Lab, Access Now, um, and Amnesty International, their work um, helping journalists and human rights defenders to understand and determine that we are being under surveillance, I think has been vital uh, for journalists all around the world. So since CNA is here, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, yes, um, we uh, suspected, uh, uh, we saw some weird things in the phones of one of our colleagues last year and uh, we sent her phone um, to be, be analyzed by Access Now and Citizen Lab, and they found out that she had been infected with Pegasus. So they asked us for the phones of the rest of the team. So yes, most of uh, El Faro employees were infected with Pegasus, 22 people out of um, a 34 people organization. And uh, we had been intervened almost constantly for for a year and a half. So when we got the results, what we did is that we crossed um, the, the moments of the most intense interventions into uh, our phones with our news cycle. And no surprise, it matched with um, the highest peaks were exactly the days around, which means before, during, and after we published the most sensitive materials that affected uh, the government. I'm talking basically about big corruption scandals, about the publications that we did of the Salvadoran government negotiating with gang leaders at Truce. Um, that's where the peaks were. So it was obvious that um, it, 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 it was of course related. Uh, furthermore, Citizen Lab was able to determine, and I think this was a first, um, uh, the geographical location of the Pegasus operator, at least in one of, of, of our phones. And um, it was of course located in, in El Salvador. Um, what consequences has it had for us in terms, especially for our work? I was listening to um, Hadilla and, um, and although I don't think we have uh, had so many phones uh, still uh, um, um, scanned by Citizen Lab and Access now. Um, uh, of course, some of the things you, you, you said, Hadia, sounded very familiar as a lot of our sources uh, completely stopped talking to us. And of course, this is in, in journalistic terms, very important to say, uh, because usually, uh, in countries uh, like mine, uh, you depend more and more on sources because the government closes all uh, official information that is usually 
um, uh, accessed by the public is now completely closed. So you depend more and more on sources. When the sources heard that we had been infected with Pegasus, they got scared and they stopped talking to us. So it makes our job all, all the more um, difficult. Of course, um, Pegasus is not the only way to, to surveil journalists. And I'm sure the same uh, you, you've been going through, Hadiya, is as the uh, cars outside our homes, drones sent uh, to our windows, um, uh, brutal campaign of delegitimation, uh, legal attacks against us. We have four ongoing tax uh, uh, investigations where the government is concluding that we evaded taxes deliberately, which of course we are protesting because it's not true. The president has gone on national broadcasting uh, television address accusing us of money laundering. Uh, we have two ongoing investigations uh, uh, about a sex abuse case. Uh, and I think this is a first also where there is no victim. So there is a, a sexual abuse case without a victim. Um, uh, we have received a lot of threats uh, and of course uh, a, a lot of following ourselves. As, as Hadiya said, and I completely, the situation is very familiar. Um, we are sure that uh, their main objective in, in terms of the surveillance operation is of course to determine who is talking to us, who are our sources giving away information that may be sensitive to the government that they want to hide uh, from the public, which is of course one of um, the main uh, uh, tasks of uh, investigative um, journalism. So yes, what, what we did after we realized that we had been, after we published the Pegasus infections, uh, we put a notice at the attorney general's office, which is of course not independent and he serves the government. So we are not expecting any results there, but we did it just to have the record there that, that uh, there is a notification. It was put by the uh, Salvadoran Association of Journalists because of course, we are not the only media targeted with or infected with Pegasus. There's other media and other journalists in El Salvador. We are just, let's put it that way, the biggest or the most scandalous case, not only for the amount of members, but for the amount of time they stayed in our phones, operating our cameras, microphones, and having access to our chats, our videos, our photos, and even all our private life. And of course, uh, all our contacts with, with our sources. Um, we asked for a special audition at the Inter-American Human Rights Commission. We are already beneficiaries of uh, what they call cautionary measures, um, uh, which uh, makes the government directly responsible for our security. Um, and so we asked for a special audition. Um, Citizen Lab Access Now and Amnesty International came with us and we uh, basically um, informed the commission about what was going on, what we had uh, found out, uh, the infections with Pegasus. And the government also had its space to, to say, of course, that to deny all accusations, to say they were not responsible for uh, the, the surveillance with Pegasus, which is, of course, almost uh, impossible because um, NSO, the company, says uh, that it only sells the software to security governmental agencies. So it's a government. And Citizen Lab determined that the operator is, is in El Salvador. So the, the equation is very easy. It is a government operating in El Salvador. So chances are it is actually the Salvadoran government behind this. But if you allow me to, to, to say something else, Carlos, um, NSO uh, has expressed under oath that it only sells the software to clients previously approved or vetoed by the Israeli Ministry of Defense. Israel is a government that should be brought to accountability because if there is someone, the single government that knows every client using Pegasus against journalists and human rights defenders that has actually approved uh, uh, the selling of this software, it is the Israeli government. 
Thank you very much, Carlos. Uh, what a powerful, uh, powerful intervention and uh, how thorough the, the surveillance and the attack against El Faro and other independent media in, in El Salvador has been. Um, you mentioned um, the lack of independence of uh, uh, government officials and I would even extend in many countries uh, the lack of independence, independent judicial courts, uh, judi judicial systems and, and, and judges. Uh, to deal with this issue, and and often we are forced, uh, which that that's what it is. We're forced to to go to reach out to international mechanisms, as you mentioned, the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights, uh, the European Court of Human Rights. Uh, there are some instruments in uh, mechanisms in Africa as well that can be can be used, or at the UN. And in that sense, I just want, want to bring in uh, Caroline um, uh, Wilson Palo from Privacy International. First of all, thank you very much for taking time off uh, from your family. I know it's a bank holiday in the UK today uh, for, for being with us. Uh, Privacy International has uh, done uh, probably the most uh, uh, interesting litigation uh, against government surveillance in Europe and elsewhere. And you've been at the forefront of these efforts uh, to bring governments to account, to counter government surveillance. Uh, could you give us an overview of the, I think you're, you're ahead of the curve in many ways in, uh, in, in fighting this, this type of abuse. So could you give us an overview of that and uh, which obstacles do you think are, are relevant when we're engaging in this type of, of uh, litigation in court, uh, you know, aiming for accountability against governments uh, and companies? Thank you. Certainly. Uh, thank you. Thank you for that kind introduction. Thank you for inviting me to, to be here today. Um, so yes, as you said, uh, Privacy International has been looking um, and working on litigation against government surveillance for over a decade now. We started um, actually looking at surveillance companies like NSO Group, uh, Gamma Group, and others who were um, using this uh, software that, as we now see, has proliferated so much. Um, and at that time, a decade ago, we felt that we didn't really have, as an organization, the resources to bring litigation directly against the companies. And as CNS so clearly laid out, um, you know, there are sort of a variety of different mechanisms um, that could be used to engage um, in litigation around trying to prevent this type of abuse, especially through government action. So what we decided to do was we um, focused on challenging governments and the, the legal regimes that they had in place governing their use of, of hacking and other forms of surveillance as well. And, um, and a lot of that litigation developed uh, within Europe, both within the United Kingdom where we are located um, and also a variety of other European countries were able to intervene or assist um, claimants in those cases too. And we have ended up at the European Court of Human Rights uh, several times as well. So to just sort of give a, a brief overview of, of that litigation, um, on hacking in particular, our litigation has been most fruitful in the United Kingdom. So we uh, started this campaign back in um, litigation campaign back in 2014 when we um, saw no legal regime whatsoever governing the UK government's uh, use of hacking technology, either within the UK or outside of the UK. Uh, and so we took the UK government to court uh, saying this lack of legal regime is a complete violation of all your human rights obligations. Um, and there was pushback, uh, unsurprisingly, from the UK government on that. But in the end, we ended up with several positive um, outcomes. One is that the UK government did put a law in place, um, the Investigatory Powers Act, which now governments have, governs uh, hacking within the UK. It's certainly not a perfect law, <laughs> um, but it does give us the foundations of some safeguards, including, as we talked about today, um, for protection of journalists, so that there needs to be quite a high bar met if the UK government is going to attempt um, to, to hack journalists um, specifically. And that was one of the things that we really pushed for um, was a really hard bar generally uh, for the use of hacking, especially proving up um, why an individual needs to be targeted and making sure that there was a really close tie between that, that reason and the government's national security reason for hacking. 
Uh, we also at the UK level had uh, some wins in that the government said that general warrants, which was the idea that it's a warrant that doesn't specify who's going to be hacked, um, cannot be used <laughs> for property interference generally within the UK. And that was an updating of the UK's law um, that's been in place for several hundred years, actually, to the modern hacking context. Um, so that's been another uh, big success uh, that we've had. There have been a number of challenges, however, with this litigation. Um, one of the biggest challenges is that it's hard to get courts who are not necessarily very technologically savvy to understand both the technology that's involved in, um, in hacking or other forms of intrusive surveillance and the unique intrusiveness of that surveillance too, which already you know, our other panelists have talked to so eloquently about how hacking in particular, as it can get at all of your contacts, it can extend to your contacts, can just be so much um, more intrusive even than the old fashioned breaking into to your house <laughs> and, and rifling through your papers. Um, and that has not al always been a bit of an uphill battle. Also when litigating in this context, because we're in the national security context, courts tend to show a lot of deference to the government. Um, and we've seen that at, at the UK level, but also at the European Court of Human Rights, that um, when we've litigated on other issues and some of the other issues that um, it's also important to be aware of, the other forms of surveillance that we've litigated on include uh, bulk interception of the content of communications and the metadata of those communications, or what we call communications data here in the UK. Uh, so that bulk interception, um, we have pushed back quite hard on, and yet the European Court of Human Rights in showing deference in the national security context perhaps was not as strong as it could have been in placing safeguards. Uh, nonetheless, it did find the UK legal regime that we were challenging to be insufficient, in particular because it lacked safeguards around who was being chosen to have their communications actually examined once um, they had been picked up in bulk. And the court said there were problems with that system, both for anyone, but also in particular for journalists. Because again, there should be a, such a high bar when journalists' communications are examined and that wasn't being met. Um, so the UK was forced to go back to the drawing board on that and acknowledge that better safeguards needed to be in place. Um, that decision, of course, being a Europe-wide decision is also helpful to use to challenge other European countries, any convention members, um, if they don't have those that level of safeguard in place for journalists. Um, but also uh, we've, as I said from the beginning, decided to take this route of challenging government action and these somewhat what we call facial challenges, which is a challenge to the law, the legal regime, or sometimes we were able to proceed on hypothetical facts of this might be happening, but it's not at all related to an individual case. And the reason we chose to do this is because it we found it very difficult to build up the evidence that was necessary uh, to be able to bring these legal challenges um, either on behalf of individuals or to connect um, the surveillance from, say, for instance, understanding that a phone had been hacked to which company had done the hacking. And Citizen Lab and Amnesty have done a great job of help, helping make that connection. But then going from the company who hacked to the government responsibility for that is another um, evidentiary leap which is difficult, but it's also great that I think others are taking on, as CNS said, are taking on that challenge. Um, and I, I look forward to seeing how those, those cases play out. But so far, while it hasn't been perfect, I think we have made some, some good progress in getting better legal regimes in place in some countries, in Europe at least, and some acknowledgement from the European Court of Human Rights of the types of safeguards that need to be in place for these new modern forms of surveillance. And I hope that we can continue to build on that. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Caroline. And uh, yes, I think it's it's partly due to, to, the, to your work as legal director for Privacy International that we have um, these standards and these safeguards developed in Europe that hopefully we should build upon uh, in new litigation, and uh, that will be, uh, you know, part of the arguments that uh, will be made in court um, to to counter um, this this type of threat. And and as you say, um, the, the challenges are, are huge, uh, evidentiary. Um, the laws in many places there are no laws that authorize these uh, these interventions. They are done completely legally 
uh, in secret and getting that information has been it's extremely difficult as you said um, you know the positive I guess it's, it's the work done by Amnesty and Citizen Lab um, uh, who managed to 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 crack um, that element and and can establish when a phone has been hacked or not or has been intervened or not that's extremely helpful um, want to just now move on to to our last panelist uh, Priscilla Ruiz uh, who works at uh, Article 19, uh, she's the legal coordinator for the Digital Rights Program and has been involved also in litigation efforts, investigations in Mexico where the use of Pegasus has been established uh, at several levels of government, which is also a novelty, which is interesting to, to talk about. And uh, so Priscilla will be telling us a little bit about uh, their experience in Mexico and working with, with journalists and uh, activists um, representing them um, in court. Thank you, Priscilla. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I'm going to speak in, in Spanish. So, muchas gracias por la invitación. Thank you very much for the invitation. We began with uh, a report in the New York uh, Times entitled, We Are the New Enemies of the State, which was the spying on journalists in Mexico. And uh, Lawsuits started uh, with uh, Article 19, and it was a joint lawsuit to be able to make visible the attacks uh, that are being made against and activists and violations to human rights against activists in particular. So we began. Uh, by looking at the ped, uh, criminal code, which deals with illicit access, and we based the lawsuit on that. The lawsuit uh, was initiated in 2017, and it is still ongoing, together with these uh, organizations that I mentioned. But uh, many lines of investigation were brought, like how and why this technology was used to carry out surveillance against journalists and human rights activists. We have evidence that it has been used since 2015. It was purchased by uh, the government of Enrique Peña Nieto. And this administration uh, spent approximately 80 million, 80, 80 million dollars in the purchase of the technology. What we found in our investigation is that we found several lines that have used, shown us the use of this uh, malware, how it, is, uh, how it infects our, our devices, and how the type of interventions are carried out. Also, this has had great impact on journalists and activists, and it has helped us to understand how it works. But it has also raised a great deal of questions in the sense of, of wondering why it is being used and by whom. And in the case, we have seen that the defense uh, ministry, the national defense ministry, which has used this type of technology, the intelligence uh, investigation center, and uh, the, um, the general attorney are all using this technology. And it's very clear in the code that this type of intervention has to be done via legal authorization. And this was never done. So. The whole situation within the, the file of the lawsuit has been focused on who is doing this type of intervention and why. We also found several obstacles, particularly in the access of information referring to contracts. For organizations, from our side, we have uh, requested the National Institute of Transparency and also the transparency units and government institutions themselves. We have requested information, and what we've seen is that they hide 
the information, particularly on contracts, and um, they um, do not respond to questions on the acquisition of technology. We know perfectly well that these uh, government organizations have purchased under these contracts that um, are painted as uh, something else in an attempt to hide the information. And we know the type of technology that is being used and for whom. It has been uh, quite a difficult uh, litigation, but it has also given a great deal of satisfaction in the sense that we have found new forms, new ways to be able to submit the evidence, even how to preserve the chain of evidence. In Mexico, the part of digital evidence is not very well known, and obviously there is a great deficiency. And this has been carried out jointly with the authorities so that it can be protected and this accessibility to evidence uh, can, can be, so that evidence can be available in the file of the lawsuit. Another difficulty is uh, the forensic, the technology uh, forensic actions. We have had to resort to other organizations like Citizen Lab in the sense of being able to have uh, more detailed evidence and more consistent ev evidence in respect of what is being alleged. This is uh, one of the lines that we have been integrating into the lawsuit. One of the main objectives of this investigation is to find those responsible. We know that NSO group has been has, has been having inter, inter action interference exclusively with the governments. Apparently, it's a technology that's only being sold to governments. But in the Mexican case, we have seen interventions by third parties. There are companies that since their incorporation in the public registry, they are incorporated as uh, security companies, security services companies. And uh, these companies are contracted directly for many millions to be able to purchase this type of technology. So th these third parties have um, helped to hide the, the activities of NSO group with the government. We have found many companies that are connected to security issues. We don't know what kind of technology they are selling, but it is being purchased by the Center of Intelligence, by National Defense, for military purposes that have been, been using this espionage. So this file, this research file, has helped us to make visible many things that uh, they are using. And particularly, one of the essential elements is something that Kamaji had uh, spoken about. One of the whistleblowers have spoken about uh, one of the main elements that have given valuable uh, information on the purchase and particularly on uh, government officials of the government of Mexico who have pointed out who and why this kind of intervention uh, on in vigilance and communications is done. We know that in Mexico this is done in a framework of uh, social and political crises and a human rights crisis and that the administration denies and does not recognize that uh, this type of surveillance and violations to human rights are being carried out. So to be able to make progress with a lawsuit, this type of information has helped us to complete the information, the research for the, the lawsuit. And particularly, it has given us a lot of strength from, for the organizations to strengthen the coordination that we have among us. This has been essential because each one of us has, has 
been acting since our experience and expertise to be able to push the case. It's not a recent case. We have been uh, promoting this lawsuit since uh, 2017. And a lot of doors have closed for us, but others have opened. So jointly, we have been able to find a lot of evidence, which is important and relevant to be able to understand how this type of technology is used against uh, journalists, activists, or dissidents, uh, to uh, dissidents in respect of what the government says. It is important to mention that this brings um, one asks oneself, what, happen, what is happening in democratic states? Why is this kind of technology being used to, sur to carry out surveillance against uh, people who are defending human rights, who are carrying out uh, investigations and who are bringing up cases that are important? Within this uh, file, the file of the lawsuit, what is, was emphasized was how specifically um, there was surveillance against journalists and activists who were researching the case of the 43 uh, uh, individuals disappeared in Yotzinapa, the massacre of uh, the White House and the administration of Enrique Peña Nieto. So this is a pattern, a pattern that is being followed, and this has to be considered from this uh, wider perspective. In this sense, it's important to put into question why the government is using this and how. This also involves having a greater uh, transparency and greater uh, accountability towards governments to be able to ask them why they are using this type of technology. This is a road that has opened the road uh, to dialogue and that has brought to the table what is a way to regulate this type of situation. And we have also found obstacles against uh, this as well. Thank you very much. 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 Thank you very as a civil society organization trying to, to navigate investigations and, and bringing people to account, but also at the, the government level. And uh, even though you have a law, it wasn't followed um, and the difficulty in getting information. But at least you, you succeeded, and that's very impressive that you have established so many facts already in, the, in this investigation that, uh, that is tremendous. Uh, we're running out of time, unfortunately, but I think we all benefited from some amazing presentations. I have, uh, I'll be objective and I'll ask one question only because we have three minutes and I'll, I'll use an objective criteria, which is so Khadija, you, you had the longest journey to, to come to Uruguay from, from all of us. Uh, so I'll address my question to you. Um, it's not a common uh, issue for, for journalists to have lawyers or, or to know how the law works, how the, the legal world and the judicial system works. So uh, what, what are the, the difficulties for, for journalists in terms of finding legal representation and uh, trying to, to go after these uh, companies or governments who have been uh, spying on them? Could you, could you tell us a little bit about this and then uh, I will wrap up, wrap up, thanks. Well, uh, I remember one investigation uh, that was taking place when journalist was arrested and the government claimed that they found arm in his, uh, in his apartment. Uh, right under the cattle of his baby. Like he had a newborn baby and there was a cattle and uh, like the bed of the baby and under the bed in the toy box they found gun. So what lawyer did, uh, the late lawyer of mine, he was representing that case as well. He filed a request of information to the company that produced that arm and found who bought it. So that's how they linked this uh, arm to another arm that was uh, found in another political case and uh, then linked the, they found basically that the arm was planted by law enforcement. So it helped to investigate. But what was amazing to me that the arm producing company in Russia actually responded the request of information and uh, gave the name of the purchaser, which is absolutely not a case in NSO uh, situation. NSO 
denies any request to give information about um, the purchaser of this uh, uh, technology. They say, we sell only to governments. But who in the government? Which government? So who has been, uh, for example, tapping uh, President Macron's phone? Was that French government or was that another government? Or in my case, my government can tell that it's one of the enemy countries that is listening to you or uh, creates an illusion of listening to you so to make us look bad. So that's, that's the responses we get. The government in Azerbaijan says, we do not listen to people because they have no because there are requirements in law. The law in Azerbaijan actually requires them to provide, to give a, to get a permission from court to tap someone. Or if it's urgent, they can start tapping you, but in 24 hours or the latest 48 hours, they have to report to the court about wh why they've been doing that. So the law is good actually. But they've been violating law. Who cares about law if you have a power? So our government denies any involvement, and we cannot get information from NSO. And I don't know whom to sue, because NSO would not provide information. And this UN forum probably is the best place to speak out about it. Like, there should be international mechanism to force to convince or I don't know to oblige those uh, companies producing this harmful technologies to tell whom they are selling it to whom exactly so that's that's a problem and we need uh, we need to find a mechanism that will uh, that will force NSO for example to uh, give information who particularly ordered tapping of my phone because I don't know whom to sue. And then when I know whom to sue, that there is another problem with the lawyers. Lawyers are being intimidated for uh, taking those uh, cases. They are under constant harassment and pressure. One of my lawyers lost his license because the, the government didn't like what he was doing, uh, representing the politically sensitive cases. So, um, that we need international mechanism for protection of our lawyers as well. So that's that's uh, absurd of the thing. And I've been listening to Carlos, and he said about the cautionary measures he uh, he had to get. And I try to convince myself that the Universal Declaration of Human Rights does not have that clause in it, obliging government. Uh, where the government has positive obligation of providing security for each citizen of it. And uh, this is like, a, this is absurd of the situation. We need international mechanism to convince the government to protect its own citizens. That's, I mean, that's, that, that's where we have to, for cry fall. That's where we have to tell, like, it's it's an absurd. Why government bring that shame on themselves? Why do they uh, uh, force us to go to international resorts? I, I'm, am, I, am, I, uh, am I happy to go to European Court of Human Rights? No, but that's the only way. That's the only way I can achieve a minimum justice in my cases. So this is where, this is a UNESCO forum, and I believe that the governments are listening to it. And I just want to say, shame on you for doing that to your own citizens and forcing us, making us to go to international forums and uh, uh, speaking about for our rights, because our rights are not respected in our homes. Well, thank you very much, Khadija, for, for, for your intervention. And uh, I, I don't think I can add anything else after what you said. I think uh, we, 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 we sign up to, to, to what you said. And you should be applauded by, by your courage and uh, 
for your work over the years and, and for, what, for speaking out against this. I hope uh, governments are, are listening. Um, so thank you very much for, for attending this panel, those from home and those here in the audience. Uh, I'll wrap up now and um, I hope we were, able, we were able to provide some highlights on litigation efforts and attempts at bringing accountability um, for hacking and surveillance of journalists and, uh, and that will contribute uh, with other measures and other tactics that uh, should be deployed, should be used to counter government spionage uh, against journalists and public interest actors, as you mentioned, activists and lawyers as well have been targeted by, by Pegasus. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, UNESCO, for, for organizing the panel. And uh, have a good rest of the conference. Bye.